Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to my Adventures in Pure Mathematics series. Today, I want to talk about one of the oldest results in algebraic geometry, and it goes by the name of Bezu's theorem. Now, this is a very, very old theorem, and in fact, it's so old that we're not quite sure who first uh, realized that it was true. Certainly, Newton thought about this problem quite a bit. And however, the credit goes to Bezu because it was in his 1779 PhD thesis uh, at the University of Paris. And the question that it concerns is very simple, okay, and it's a very natural question. You look at two polynomials in x and y, f and g, and say, what are the common zeros to these? And ask for the number of these solutions. Okay, so it's a very natural question that you can ask. And we're going to have a look at this question today and see what Bazoo's answer to the question is. So let's pick a simple example here. Okay, so the first uh, polynomial that we look at will be just y minus x times x plus 1 times x minus 1. So when is this equal to 0? Of course, that's just a graph of y equals this cubic here. So that's easy enough. You can draw that in. So it has zeros at minus 1, 0, and 1. And you can just draw it in like that. That defines some sort of curve. We call it a cubic curve. And let's suppose we call it C. The other polynomial will just set equal to y. It's a simple one. And y equals 0 just gives you this x-axis here. Let's call that D. And in this case, it's quite easy to see what the number of solutions to both of these equations are. Okay. There are three points of intersection of these two curves. So the number of solutions, often denoted c dot d, is just three. So there's a simple example which answers this question. But if you want to think about this in general, we need to know about the principle of continuity. So let me sl state slowly what this principle of continuity is. It states that the number of points of intersection vary continuously as you vary the curves C and D. Now, of course, what does it mean to vary the curves C and D? I guess if you want to vary them continuously, you really need to have a topological space whose points are given by these curves. And that's quite a subtle point that I don't want to get into today, so we'll just think of this in a rather naive way. Okay, so let's have a little think about how you can vary these curves C and D. So the simplest thing that you can do is you can take this curve, which is the x-axis, and you can just move it up and down slightly. If you move it down, you'll see that, well, this in point of intersection moves slightly to the left, this slightly to the right, and this slightly to the left. But the thing is that the number of solutions hasn't changed at all. So it stays the same. A little small change in this d means that the number of solutions stays the same. OK, let's keep going. When you go all the way down to here, though, let's draw that in, what happens? Well, unfortunately, here now, we only have two points of intersection, here and here. However, this point of intersection is a tangential intersection between these two. So often, we can think of this as a point of intersection of multiplicity 2. So if you count this with multiplicity 2, then you'll find that there's still 2 plus 1, 3 points of intersection. And the principle of continuity can, sit, can be said to still hold here. OK, so let's vary this more. Let's push this all the way down here. OK. Now, in this case, there's only one point of intersection. OK. However, let's suppose if instead of working over the reals, we work over the complex numbers. Then what are we solving? So this has, is the line y equals some negative number, say minus c. So when you solve this one and this one here, you put in minus c for y, and you're solving a cubic equation over the complex numbers, so you have three complex roots. So although they disappear in this picture, all that's happened is that this, these two real roots suddenly became complex. So there's still three Roots. So the point of this little thought experiment 
is that if you want this principle of continuity to be true, you need to add some assumptions. Okay, so let's see what the assumptions are. Firstly, you need to count points of intersection with multiplicity. So that's the two here. The second thing is that you have to work over uh, the complex numbers as opposed to the reals. Okay, so that's a good example. Let's look at a slightly different example where we vary the curve in a slightly different way. Okay, so suppose we have, that was our D before, and we have a C like this. You have two lines, of course, they intersect in just one point. And let's suppose we vary this C now, not just by moving up and down, but let's rotate it instead. Okay, so at the moment it's still just one point of intersection. But at some point, you'll get something different. And what's that? Well, it depends. I guess it depends on how you rotate it. You can rotate it back onto D itself, in which case there'll be an infinite number of points of intersection because they're the same line. Or you can get a parallel line. So that that point of intersection, so to speak, has disappeared. So there are the two possibilities. So they show that the principle of continuity won't hold unless you do something. So what are the things that we shall do? So the first thing is that we're going to exclude the case where you have the same curve. And more generally, what we need to do is we have to make sure that these two polynomials, f and g, have no common divisor. If they have a common divisor, they basically have a common curve, and so there's going to be an infinite number of points of intersection. The other thing is that we have to see what happens to that point that disappeared when you rotate to a parallel line like that. Well, when you rotate like this, where's the point of intersection? It started off here, and as you rotate, it kind of moved off to infinity. Okay. You could have also rotated it the other way, and it would have moved off to infinity this way. So to preserve the principle of continuity, what we need to do is we need to add an extra point at infinity. So we add a point at infinity. One thing that's interesting to note, though, is that even though we think of this in terms of rotating this line as a limit, this point at infinity is the same whether you shoot off in this direction or in this direction. That's just how it works. Of course, something else you might want to do is you might want to look at a third parallel line. These two lines now will intersect at some point at infinity, and of course it's the same point at infinity as the intersection of these two lines. Okay, now let's look at this line here. If you throw in another parallel line, these two lines will also need to intersect. So we also add a point at infinity here. So in fact, we add points at infinity for each direction. And we'll actually get a whole line of points at infinity. So the other thing that we need to do to make sure that we have the principle of continuity is we have to add points at infinity to get something called the projective plane. And that's something that often we denote with this um, notation here, CP2. So one way to think about adding points to this affine plane to get the projective plane is it's similar to how if we want to study general polynomial equations, we add roots such as the square root of minus 1 to the real numbers to get the complex plane. And that's, in fact, what we did here to make sure that we had the principal continuity holding here, because some of the roots suddenly became complex. So in this case, we do a similar thing here. Okay, so now we come to the statement of Bazou's theorem. So again, we're going to look at two polynomials in x and y, f and g. And as I mentioned, we need to assume that they have no common factor. And what we want to do is we want to look at the number of points of intersection of the curves C, defined by f of x, y equals 0, 
and D defined by G of XY equals zero. It's going to be noted C dot D. And remember that when we count these points of intersection, we need to look at them inside the projective plane, and we need to count the points of intersection with multiplicity. And there's a formula which, of course, has to depend on F and G. And it's a very nice formula. So what's that formula? It just depends on the degrees of F and G. In fact, it's just the degree of F times the degree of G. So as a simple example, if F and G are quadratic, then you get two conics, and you're intersecting two conics, maybe like two ellipses. And then 2 times 2 is the predicted number of points of intersection. And in this picture here, you actually see all four points of intersection. So in this case, the multiplicities or the intersections are all 1. And the way I've drawn it, all the points have real coordinates, so you actually see them here as well. Okay, so you might ask, why is this true? And let me give you a brief explanation using the principle of continuity. Okay, so I guess uh, the easiest case to deal with is when one of the polynomials has degree 1. So suppose that's f, in which case the zeros of that is just some sort of a line. The other one is going to be just some curve. So this is a linear function, so that means that you can use one of the variables to eliminate the other one. And then at the end of the day, you're just solving one polynomial equation in just one unknown, as opposed to x and y. Since that has degree d, uh, degree, the degree of g, that tells you that the number of points of intersection is just the degree of g, which is the degree of g, times 1, which is what we assume the degree of f to be. Okay. So that was the case where one of them has degree 1. What about if uh, the degree of f is greater than 1? Well, in this case, we need to invoke the principle of continuity. And it's easy to see just with a simple example, such as this one here. f of xy equals xy minus 1. So this has degree 2. We assume each of x and y have degree 1, so the total degree is 2. And we can look at the curve that this defines, f equals 0, and we know certainly that the curve it defines is this hyperbola here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the principle of continuity and vary this. And remember, the principle of continuity says that if you vary this, it doesn't change the number of points of intersection. Okay, so how do we vary it? Well, what we're going to do is instead of setting this equal to 0, we're going to look at x, y minus lambda equals 0. And now lambda is something that can vary. It's going to start at 1. And we look and see what happens as lambda goes to 0. So I guess as you make lambda smaller, you'll get still, but not 0, you'll still get a hyperbola. And as it gets smaller, it goes like this. It sticks closer to the x and y axis until when this hits zero, it snaps into and it becomes two lines. So the number of points of intersection of this curve with the curve defined by g equals zero is the same as the number of points of intersection of these two lines with this curve here. Now we're actually reduced to the case where we have degree 1, because this line will intersect this curve in degree g, number of points, and the other line will also intersect this curve in degree g, number of points. So in total, you'll have 2 times degree g, number of points of intersection, and this idea actually generalizes.